I'm Karen Taylor, uh, Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, and I am so pleased you can all be here with us this evening. This, of course, includes our in-person audience and indeed our online audience. For those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen was, of the City of New York was founded in 1785 by 22 artisans. The General Society Library, of course, for in-person audience of which you're in tonight, and which was, by the way, was founded um, in 1820 in a different home. The John M. Mossman Lock Museum. And again, for in-person audience, uh, we, we invite you to visit the Lock Museum after the talk tonight. And finally, our nearly 200 year old lecture series um, of which of course tonight was part of, was actually started in 1837. So we have a very distinguished tradition. It's a great pleasure this evening to introduce you to our two guests who will be talking about Prop Man, from John Wick to Silver Linings Playbook, from Boardwalk Empire to Parks and Recreation. And that, of course, is just a few of the books that are featured. And this book happens to be available for purchase this evening and will be available at the end of the talk. And for our online audience, you will be able to access it, access it through visiting Princeton Architectural Press website. Ross McDonald has designed and fabricated props for more than a hundred movies and television series. He has also contributed to periodicals like Airmail, Vanity Fair, The New York Times, The New Yorker, Newsweek, Time and Rolling Stone, and has an written and illustrated books for adults and for children. Stephen Heller was the senior art director at The New York Times for more than three decades. Currently, he is co-chair of the MFA Design Department, of the School of Visual, Visual Arts in New York. He's the author and co-author of more than 200 books, very impressive, on popular culture and writes the daily Heller for printmag.com. And I also just want to mention that uh, Stephen uh, currently has a, uh, a book out at the moment. And the title of that book, Stephen, if you could just remind me, is... Growing Up Underground. Growing Up Underground, a memoir. Great book. Briefly, <laughs> briefly. Um, it's now my huge pleasure to introduce to you this evening, Ross McDonald and Stephen Heller. So, uh... I'm going to start off talking because Ross is going to take over. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to do. It feels like we're in a Ross McDonald prop. Uh, he has done work on the Gilded Age or HBO, so this is a, a fitting venue. Uh, Ross and I got to know each other through the New York Times. Uh, he is an illustrator, uh, did one of my favorite issues of all time where he took comic book pages and redid all the ads that would be in the back of comic books for an entire issue of the New York Times Book Review. And it's uh, a, a treasure. He is a terrific uh, parodist, uh, mimic and originator. And he's now become a great forger. So if any of you need official papers or documents. Passport started $100. It's, it's cheaper than other places, I guarantee. <laughs> so we're going to start off with Ross giving you a little background into how he came to make props for movies, many of which are really actors in themselves. Uh, the props give a, a hint of content of, of the plot of the character. Uh, how can, 
actors work with props is as important as the lines themselves. And uh, Ross is one of the unseen, but uh, very important backstage participants in many movies and TV shows. So Ross, can you talk about your sure. ancient life? <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I'm gonna start off uh, just by showing some a current illustration. This was a, an illustration I did for the New York Times Book Review fairly recently. Uh, this is of uh, an athlete from the 30s and 40s called Jim Thorpe. Um, and so I'm still doing illustration work for magazines and uh, newspapers and, and other uh, uh, venues. But uh, I, and, and I do have a tiny bit of background in television production about 100 million years ago when I lived in Toronto, I was working on very low rent television shows. Um, but then I got into illustration, that became my career, it was 100% of what I did. And I was working on um, some fairly high profile stuff back in the early 90s. Um, there's a cover of the New York Times magazine for the crossword puzzle issue. This is, I think, 90. I'm forgetting the year. I think it's 93. Maybe it says on it. I can't read it from here. But um, it's got my style back then was primarily uh, influenced by the books I had seen growing up, which were mainly books in the 1930s. Not that I'm that old, but um, Dick and Jane. Yeah, Dick and Jane was a huge influence on me. I grew up in rural Canada, and uh, when I went to school, they were still using textbooks from the 1930s. Um, so I was, you know, exposed. To, I remember uh, during kindergarten. The teachers at the last day of kindergarten, the teachers brought these. I remember as bringing out the Dick and Jane books on a golden platter. I could be, you know, embellishing that a bit. But anyway, they brought out the Dick and Jane to say, these are the books that you'll be reading as you move on to grade one. And you're all, oh my God, they have pictures. Um, and so that was a huge influence. And, and you know, as an illustrator, as an adult, I drew on on a lot of that stuff that I had absorbed. So that, that explains the style. Uh, here's another example. This was also for the New York Times Magazine. I don't remember what the story was, something, something um, scary as hell, I guess. This is in, also in the early 90s, you know, just a, a Tuesday evening in America, um, family sitting around, you know, loading their firearms. I don't remember again what the story was about. But that was kind of the stuff that was out there at the time. Um, so at one point, uh, my wife and I were at a party and we ran into this guy and the guy, we had mutual friends and he knew my work and he was just starting work on a movie that was filming out in Chicago. So, and he said, oh my God, you'd be perfect for this thing that we need, we need to do this uh, faux 1930s children's book. So I found myself out in Chicago. I got a phone call from John Hughes and next thing I knew I was on a airplane to uh, um, LA and then to Chicago where I worked for six months on set uh, working on the movie Baby's Day Out um, which he wrote and produced he didn't direct uh, and the movie is about if you haven't seen it it's about a little baby he's a, a uh, you know the son of a, a very wealthy couple he gets kidnapped and taken away to the city by these bumbling kidnappers because it's a comedy and he uh, his favorite, they bring his favorite kids book because it's the thing he always likes to see and they think it'll keep him quiet. And his favorite kids book is this book, Baby's Day Out. And it's all about a baby's trip to the city. So of course the baby thinks, wow, here I am. I'm living out my favorite book. He escapes from the kidnapper just, you know, through their sheer ineptitude. And he's wandering around Chicago, um, you know, getting into cabs and crawling into buses and going into stores and stuff. Nobody ever noticed that, that there's this little baby. Um, and because of the fact that he was a little baby who couldn't speak, uh, the device that the filmmakers used to sort of communicate what the baby was thinking to us, the audience, was they would do this thing where the baby, we'd see the baby uh, crawling along, and then maybe we'd see a taxi cab on the street cut back to the close-up of the baby's face and the baby's kind of going, ah, cut back to the cab and they'd cross dissolve to an illustration from the book with it showing a cab, crosses all back to the real cab, 
cut back to the baby's face going, ah, cab, like from the book, get it? And he crawling into the cabin. You know, so they use that device several times throughout the movie. Um, so you see a lot of the book in the movie, uh, but also you see close-ups. There's some sketches, uh, early sketches, trying to work out, you know, the baby and the name and all the various stuff from it. Um, there's the baby. Uh, because they didn't really know what to do with me, in the early 90s, this is in 93, um, there were very few, they didn't really have uh, graphic artists working on movies very often. If they needed any graphics, they would hire guys. And in fact, one of the guys that I worked with on Days Day Out is this guy, Ted Hay. He was one of the first graphic designers on a movie. And how he got that job was he was working in uh, North Carolina or Virginia uh, as a sign painter. And he, they were doing some shooting and they kept coming in and getting him to paint signs. And that led to full-time work. And so when I met him, he was living in LA, working full-time on the uh, but that was kind of, you know, the Wild West when it came to graphic designers, graphic artists working on movies. And um, so they didn't, like I said, they didn't quite know what to do with me. So they stuck me in the producer's trailer. So I was there. The producer and I shared a trailer. Meanwhile, there were 10 people in the art department. They all shared one trailer. They were packed in like sardines. And because I was in the producer's trailer, I got to meet tons of people. Um, and the, the baby's trailer was right next door. And I got a lot of access. And like I said, I worked there for six months. So I, I'd gone from working at a drawing board, you know, 20 hours a day to suddenly being on this ginormous production. And I mean, you can see that's the rooftop set of the kidnapper's apartment. Um, so a lot of times sets are broken up. So there's a rooftop set. Uh, there's another set where um, you see more of the fire escapes and stuff uh, lower down that are cut off in this thing. Uh, there's also scenes of inside the apartment. Those are all completely different places. They're built separately and everything like that. Um, but this is what I was seeing, you know, every day when I was working. And um, there's another set. There's a uh, section of the movie where the baby gets into this giant skyscraper that's under construction and there's lots of you know baby crawling out on i beams and you know buckets swinging through the air and stuff and that was all done this is all built inside a ginormous warehouse in chicago uh they built a four or five story skyscraper steel you know it's the real deal built indoors and then what's hanging there on the upper right is what they thought uh was one of the largest painted backdrops that had ever been produced for a movie. And that's counting the uh, backdrop of um, Mount Rushmore in North by Northwest, which is a huge painted backdrop. So um, some of them, I don't believe that one, but some of the backdrops. So you, do you think after doing this movie that you would be doing other movies? I did not. I mean, when I was done, I came back in the fall and uh, thought, you know, I, I went right back to my drawing board and I thought that was fun. I'll never do that again. Like, when are they ever going to need a book in a movie again? So I didn't really, you know, think it would ever come up. I did some graphics work for Saturday Night Live and I did some graphics work for, uh, for Nick at Night. Uh, but it was more like, you know, just illustration stuff. So, when I saw Baby Stay Out, I just freaked because that's Ross's work yeah. <laughs> and it was so beautifully uh, intercut yeah. yeah seamless yeah that's the only time I ever got a credit to on a movie that I worked on I never got a credit since and I'm in the, I'm in the opening credits if you can believe that that's like getting anointed by God You're a or something. star yeah <laughs> that's right everyone coming through star coming through um so again that you know another ginormous background i mean again this is all inside you know it's it's and to me this was just like i mean i i don't think i ever picked my jaw up off the floor the whole six months that i was there and i met tons of people as i mentioned and they they were all very nice and very kind you know obviously i was an idiot and they were you know very nice about telling me how stuff works like 
don't wander in front of the camera when they're shooting and stuff like that. Um, the the uh, director of photography is is the god of the set, you know. And, and if you need to, like I needed to uh, draw the babies from certain angles, but they were shooting. There's two babies play one baby. They were shooting them, and so I was um, taught how to approach the set and request permission. I mean, everybody's very nice, but there's like an etiquette that you don't, you know. Like I, I was, I think, probably about to blunder onto the set to say, hey, can I draw that baby that you're shooting? <laughs> Somebody took me aside. But yeah, I mean, I thought I'd never do that again. It was just this wild thing. Um, and I was, uh, you know, continuing to work as an illustrator. And, and during that period, uh, in the late 90s, we moved out of New York City and moved up to Connecticut. And uh, one day I get a phone call. There's a couple more shots from uh, Baby's Day Out, um, which is a hilarious movie, by the way. If you haven't seen it, it's well worth checking out. I just love the scene where uh, the big moop is stomping out the fire on Joe Montana's crotch. It's, anyway, uh, it makes me want to see it. <laughs> yeah, right? So, about 10 years later, I get a phone call from somebody because I stayed in touch with all the guys that I worked with, or a lot of the guys that I worked with. Uh, most of them were the set decorators or uh, set decorators and set designers. Um, and at that time, like I said, graphic artists were uh, really unknown on, on a movie set or on a movie crew. And uh, a lot of times paper props or things like posters or graphics or things would come up and um, well, just to explain, the, the prop master is who I'm often work, working for, and uh, everything is very um, regimented on a, on a movie crew. Um, the prop master handles anything that an actor touches, and that includes things like glasses and watches and jewelry. Um, other parts of an actor's uh, costume would be wardrobe. If this were a movie set, uh, it would have been designed and drawn by a set designer. It would have been built by the construction crew. The art director is the liaison between the set designers and the construction crew. And then all of the stuff, all of the lamps, you know, uh, all of the books, um, all of the stuff that's around us, the chairs, everything like that would be the set decoration uh, department. And they're in charge of not just, you know, unfolding a bunch of folding chairs, but often uh, you know, they might do things like actually make the lighting fixtures. Um, you know, they, they have a very wide ranging, um, you know, a set of things that they have to cover. So does the prop master, like everything from guns to cars to, you know, the can of hairspray that some, you know, it's just vast, the amount of stuff that comes up. And so when a prop master in those days, I had to do something that involved a book or graphics. They would often go to the closest thing that the movie had to an art department, which would be the set designers. And because I'd worked with all these set designers on Baby's Day Out, when the prop master for the Alamo went and asked um, the set designers, uh, hey, do you know anybody that knows anything about books? They said, oh yeah, there's this guy that we work with. He collects like junky old books and stuff and he might know what you need. So the guy uh, called me up and said, hey, uh, we're working on this movie, The Alamo. Uh, William Travis is one of the you know, one of the real guys. We need his journal. Have you have any idea what that would have looked like? And it was like all of these years that I'd spent going to flea markets and collecting these weird books that I'm thinking to myself, why, why the hell am I buying this? Why am I spending $10 for this old thing? And it's like, oh, finally, I'm getting a sign from God for why I've been doing this, why I've been wasting my time and money all these, all these years. Um, because I happen to have, so it's 1835, I happen to have an 1835 ledger, and they said, William Travis's book, the only thing we know about it, store-bought ledger. And so I started describing what this thing would have looked like, and I said, he's, he's on horseback, he would have had something like a pocket ledger, it's small, hardcover, pale blue covers, brown leather spine, uh, it would have had lined pages. It would have 
and rules rule changes. That he knows this is incredible. Well, yeah, all this time spelt, spent staring at this stuff, but also because I forgot to mention, I have a background. I started out as a printer and uh, very, I was working for a high-end, uh, very small publisher uh, who was printing a lot, all of their own books, but they're also doing a lot of work for uh, galleries and exhibitions and high-end promotional stuff. And then I started a letterpress printing operation with my older brother and a couple other people. And we were doing a lot of the same kind of work, small press stuff uh, and high-end you know, promotional things and posters and stuff, all hand typeset. So I'd had an introduction to old printing equipment and how to run it. And I got really good at fixing old broken down equipment. And I'd encountered this thing, which is called the Hickok ruling machine, which is used to make line paper and still is to this day. Mm -hmm. It dates from the late 1700s. So I'm like blathering all this stuff to this guy. And uh, I said, well, you know, that's my best guess. And he said, well, we're thinking it would have like this piece of deer hide on it with like a big thong around it wrapped around a hunk of antler and, you know, really rough paper. I'm like, okay, you know, whatever you want. And then they had a production assistant go to the museum and they pulled it out. And just by sheer chance that his diary looked exactly like what I described. Uh, so that was it. I was in and I ended up working for 17 months on that movie. Just that, you know, one lucky break of describing. It's like I could have told the guy anything after that. He would have believed it. Yeah, well, you trout. He wore a space helmet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that was. And then that guy then went on and worked, you know, so it sort of slowly snowballed from there. I was working on uh, um, other movies like maybe one or two or three a year. Uh, and I do, you know, when I say 17 months on the Alamo, uh, I work, you know, off and on for a 17 month period. A lot of that movie involves letters. So there was lots of research and not a lot of research, but just a little bit of research. And that's kind of what introduced me to that aspect of, uh, of prop making, prop design, is the amount of research that, that goes into it. Well, the amount of work you put into it, the amount of research you put into it, and then how many seconds is it on screen? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, if it gets on at all. But that's the thing. I mean, one of the things that we had... Uh, so when we when I was working at the letterpress thing with my brother, we were doing these incredibly finicky letterpress handset type, you know, things. <laughs> and um, occasionally we'd have like interns in, or if we were working with some, an author or something, he might come in to help with the binding or something. Uh, just you know, as a guy to sit there and fold sheets. And we'd say, oh wait a minute, this this. These five pages have a, you know, the period at the end of the sentence, part of it broke off. And he would say, well, no one's going to notice. And our standard reply was, well, well, we notice. Like that's, you know, we notice. So that's, who, this is who we're working for, is us. And a lot of that uh, I feel like is, you know, part of the reason I get so in the weeds on some of these prop projects is just because it's it's more fun you know i mean there's plenty of props that i work on that are just real like you know ham and eggs kind of like make it work kind of things uh but when you get given a an opportunity to work on something cool of course you want to you know you want to make it look good and there's always that fantasy in my head where i'm like oh the director's going to open the box and see this prop. Oh my God, throw the script out. We got to rewrite it and make the whole thing about this prop. Um, or, you know, and that there is, there is a certain kind of truth to that. Another thing I learned at the printing operation was uh, that where the first printer that I worked at was we would do a very careful, beautiful job of wrapping the final printed thing with, you know, perfect corners and, and we would take the best example of whatever it was on the front and and then when the client came in to pick it up, they would look at the package and go, oh, wow, you know. And I remembered that. So when I send a prop to, uh, to the set, I always, you know, make an effort to do a beautiful job of wrapping it and just sort of presenting it. Because 
that's kind of who I'm working for. I'm not necessarily working for the audience. I mean, you know, the audience, you want them to enjoy it, but uh, you know, the guy who's writing the checks is who I'm working for. <laughs> so I want him to open it up and go, wow, you know, put another zero on that guy's check. <laughs> Um, so this is some of the stuff from the Alamo. And again, this is kind of where I got a taste of the research involved, finding a lot of this stuff and, you know, learning to write in the different styles of the different, you know, the different handwriting styles of the different uh, people who were writing and uh, researching. William Travis was a bit of a dandy, he designed his own military uniform. So I, I tried to find out. And this is 2003. So, I mean, the internet, there wasn't a lot of stuff. I mean, now you can find anything, almost anything on the internet. Back then it was, you know, libraries hadn't digitized any of their collections yet. Uh, a lot of stuff just was not available. Um, so it was a real chore. And then this was uh, one of the movies where I really got to go crazy in terms of research. Um, National Treasure Book of Secrets. You know, when your prop is in the title that, you know, you, you better make it look good. Um, and they just said, there was a, a long period in the beginning. I mean, we talk about this in the book where they, they couldn't quite decide. They were writing the script on the fly. They, they sold the uh, movie to Disney in, I think, November, or I think they might have sealed the deal December of um, 2006 and they started filming in January of 2007 and so they hadn't didn't even have a script yet they were sort of writing it as they went and uh, like literally I worked on set and they were you know we were shooting in the Library of Congress and they'd go wait you know everybody would have to sit there and wait for a little while and then all of a sudden new script pages would come out you know, the writer was literally sitting there right by the camera and by the actors and they would, they would go, wait a minute, what if we said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so there were a lot of changes to the Book of Secrets. It started off as a gigantic book. Um, then it was gonna be in an attache case that was chained to the wrist of a uh, Secret Service agent. Um, and then they abandoned that. And then they found, they wanted to do something in the Library of Congress and that, that generally narrowed down uh, how the book worked, but also what size and what format it could be because uh, they find it in a little hiding uh, place in the bookshelves and that determined the size. They also wanted to have a lot of loose documents in it. And what is the National Book of Secrets? Uh, the Book of Secrets is the book that every president since George Washington would write down all of the you know terrible secrets that must never be revealed about you know whatever the heck. Uh, so Trump would have it tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's got a he's got the twelve volume set uh, just for him. Um, so and because everything was just being written, uh, like typically what they would often do, I don't usually do this, but what they would often do, um, the word hero is used a lot in movies as a, what would it be, an adjective? Um, probably an adverb and maybe a participle, I don't know. But anyway, um, it's used to describe, like they'll say, we have a hero spread, meaning we're, we, we're gonna see these two pages in this book. And that's the hero spread. The rest of the book can be blank. I never like to do that because I've been on sets where an actor goes, wait, there's only two pages. I can't flip to, you know, there's a lot of, uh, it, it really limits how the actor can do their job and, and they have no chance of changing anything. Like what if the guy just finds the book and flips through it and finds the page, you know, so I don't like to do that. Um, and because they were uh, writing, as I said, I put in uh, pages from every president up until Bill Clinton. <laughs> I think I left Nixon out. I figured he'd have his own, he'd have his own volume. Um, but that was where I really got saturated in the uh, research aspect of all this stuff. And one of the things I mentioned is um, by this, uh, being able to use this smaller format, uh, they could do a shot like this. With a gigantic book, you could, you know, those big books, they, they weigh 25 or 30 pounds. 
So Nick Cage is not going to hold that thing in one hand and flip through it with the other. So that you could never do a shot like this. It would have to always be open on a table or some kind of surface. Um, so that's, you know, that's called how the prop works. Sometimes they say how it works and how it plays. Um, so there's the, uh, the cover of the Book of Secrets. Um, there's some of the interior documents. And again, this was all like self-directed. They just said, go nuts, like go put secrets in there. We don't know what we'll end up doing. So just, you know, and I'm like, okay, like Roswell. And are these all handmade by you or did you also buy things from the flea market? There's a couple of things that were from the flea market that are thrown in. Uh, most of the stuff is handmade. Some of it from scratch, like documents are made from scratch. Uh, other times I would find stuff online and use those, uh, you know, print them out and age them and use those. Um, when it got to the point where uh, I had to, I had to bring it to the set, like on a, literally on an hour's notice. Um, and I was, you know, I had to travel down to Washington to, to deliver it. And uh, at that point, I'm just like digging through drawers and throwing random stuff in to kind of fill it out to make it look like I'd done extra work. <laughs> Can you just briefly tell people how you age things? Sure. Um, I, you know, it's like this is something that you see. There's a group of people called prop replicators, fans of movies. They're kind of like the cosplay people. They're like really dedicated to some movies and they make replica props. And when you see their props, their method of aging is often tea or coffee and they'll just swab it with a rag right across the spread. But I often would think about like, how does this thing, how does, how did it get to where we see it? Like, William Travis's diary was in a saddlebag. I imagine that takes a toll on a book, you know? Does it come out of a file where it's been in CIA headquarters for 50 years? Uh, that's gonna look different than something somebody carries around in their pocket. So with the Book of Secrets, I figured it was this combination of being handled and used by a lot of people, but on a, in a very, on a very limited basis and otherwise stored in this secret compartment in the Library of Congress. So it was kind of somewhere in the middle and it was also old, it was from the late 1700s. So I used a very special paper, um, mold made paper from Germany that really looks like it's from the 1700s. And then um, I tend to age stuff. I don't use tea and coffee because uh, they're very acidic. If, you know, this thing is on the on display, permanent display. It was on display in the Library of Congress, and then it's now on display in uh, a Disney Museum in uh, in California. Uh, if I'd used tea to stain the paper, uh, it would be starting to really age the paper by now, even only, you know, a little over a decade later. Um, so I use a watercolor and I use uh, different colors of watercolor, all sort of in the sort of kind of sepia tone area. Because if you think about how a book uh, ages, like these books here, obviously it's gonna be dirtier on the very top of the pages. There's gonna be almost nothing on the bottom. And a book is hydrophilic, paper is hydrophilic, it's water loving. And if the humidity goes up and down, the book actually breathes. It breathes in, it pulls in moisture from the air and swells up a little bit. And then as it, uh, as that moisture works its way down, it'll carry some of the dirt from the top edge down into the pages. So that's where the aging comes from. It comes from the outside edges, works its way in. If you open a really old book, you hardly ever see any dirt right in the spine. So the whole uh, aging process of just swabbing stuff across a page is not, you know, even remotely realistic. Um, what about throwing it in the bathtub? Nah, I did that on a book for, uh, I had to do this huge book for The Legend of Zorro, gigantic thing. It's like maybe 14 inches wide by, I don't know what, 18, 20 inches tall. And it's about five inches thick and leather bound and everything. 
And um, I thought, okay, I have to age this thing now. And we have this little fish pond in our yard. So I just like push in the fish pond and I'm like pushing it down with my foot. The bubbles are coming up. I'm like, Great. I'm, what a genius I am. And, uh, you know, making it stay underwater so it absorbs as much water as possible. I pull it up. It now weighs like 150 pounds, completely drenched throughout. It took me about five days to dry the thing out. Like, and, you know, I was literally with the hairdryer when the FedEx guy was like honking in the dryer. <laughs> it won't dry. Um, so, yeah, I don't do that anymore. I get it wet around the edges because, again, sucking in water from the edges. Um, and then once I, I brush on a ton of water uh, around the outside edges of the book block, and then I apply uh, watercolor and stain around those edges, mainly top and, and side. And, uh, and then I'll kind of uh, fan it a little bit each way to kind of work the water in a little bit. It's very labor intensive. And then also pages, uh, if you see an old book, like if you see a book that's just from the bookstore, the edges of the pages are really, really crisp. An older book, they just didn't make them quite like that. But also it's been read, it's been read. And if you read a book a few times, the edges get a little bit frayed. If it's a really old book, it's getting more and more frayed. Um, and a really ancient book, you wanna have kind of have a deckle edge. So I will scrape or sand or rake a saw along the edge of the book block um, to give it that you know, rough edge look. And then I'll also stand it up and bash it with, I have a sculptor's mallet. It's about a 10 pound mallet. I smack the thing, because paper is incredibly tough, especially a mass of paper. It's denser than wood. So I'll smash it and then I'll, I'll go through and individually crinkle a lot of the pages, and then I'll put it in a press and flatten it to take most of that crinkling back out again. But if you see, again, a new book, the paper will be super crisp. And a book that's been read, you know, 50 or 100 times, like for these ancient occult tomes, um, the, the paper, it kind of breaks the crispness of the paper flipping through it. But it's not obviously crinkled either as a book you know it's on a shelf often or lying flat and the weight of the pages would force out any crinkles so a, a book that's too overly crinkled will look fake like you would never see a book like that and i i don't think you'd have to be an expert to look at it, something like that in a movie and go that doesn't look you know it looks fake it's too crinkled so you know it's one of those things where i i might take you know, once I've printed it, it might take me four hours to bind a book, you know, um, if I've got everything kind of prepared and ready to go to cut leather and stuff like that. And then it might take me four to eight hours to age it, <laughs> just to get it to look right, you know. And um, you got to be, you got to build it up in layers. The same with the, um, the staining. Again, just hitting it with one bash of stain is going to look like, you know, some kid spilled his lunch on it. Uh, the real aging, you know, it's different colors. It builds up. Some areas are darker than others. Uh, so that's kind of what is going on here. You're seeing a whole variety of stuff. Um, now, now, for this, if you want to see a more detailed look through this book of secrets, uh, there's a, a guy called Adam Savage. He used to be on Mythbusters. And he has a show on HBO called Tested. And one of the, the book of secrets just came up for auction uh, this last summer. And he goes through it with the, um, uh, the guy from the prop house in England. Uh, and they look through it. And you, you get a better look at all. You say stuff. one of these books. How many did you make? I made two for them, and I think I made two backups for me, which I, I kept. And, um, and then I've made additional ones since, since the, so there were four production made copies. Uh, one is the hero copy, which was the only copy that appears on screen. That's in the Disney Museum. Uh, the prop master recently put up that extra copy for auction this past summer as well uh, in LA. And um, 
then one of my other production made backup copies I sold to the assistant director on the Harry Potter movies. And he just, I, I think it's him, just sold his copy uh, at, an, at auction anyway. So. so these become almost as valuable as the real McCoy. Absolutely. The, his copy sold for $37,000. Needless to say, I did not see a penny of that money. And I sold it to him for much less, like knock a zero off. And that's what he's got it for. And at the time, I was thinking, there's no way he's going to say yes to $3,500. And he's like, yeah. Damn. Um, so yeah, these things are hugely valuable. Uh, there's another book that appears in this movie, which is William Travis's diary. And there's a scene in the movie where they show a, a burnt page from William Travis's diary. Uh, there's a currently a burned page of William Travis's diary that I made post-production that's up for auction in London right now. I think the auction ends in about a week and it's expected to fetch 2,000 to 4,000 pounds. That's for a single burnt page. Yeah. Uh, did I say William Travis? Sorry. This is uh, John Wilkes Booth's diary. Sorry about that. Um, this is uh, a, a thing that was originally very minor in the thing, but like I said before, they're writing it on the fly. So they said, we just need, there's this scene where the guy walks in and shows this guy, John Wilkes Booth's diary to translate a cipher. Uh, so it can just be some old, you know, old diary. It doesn't need to be fancy. So I started doing research. And John Wilkes Booth's diary is the subject. I mean, if you go and look online, it's wall-to-wall -wall conspiracy theories about John Wilkes Booth's diary because there are missing, as you'll see on the conspiracy theory sites, a missing 18 pages. It's actually missing 27 pages. And um, everybody's speculating like aliens wrote on those missing pages or I don't know what, but um, I started, you know, getting caught up in the story of this thing. And I got um, a file. The FBI has a file on John Wilkes Booth, believe it or not, um, because they would get letters from people saying, you know, my uncle was in a bar in New Hampshire and this guy started talking to him and said he was John Wilkes Booth. And, you know, told him about how he'd escaped and then he wasn't killed and blah, blah, blah. So there's the FBI has a file that's literally this thick. That's almost all letters from crackpot saying they've met John Lewis Booth into the seventies. And um, who's to say they're crack? <laughs> I know. Um, and so uh, there were really bad photocopies in the file from the 1970s of photographs of John Lewis Booth's diary. And I'm like, oh, you know, this, I can use this to make you know, to make this diary look good. And I started trying to track down the original photographs. It turned out they were taken by the Secret Service, which was formed just after the Civil War as an anti-counterfeiting unit, which it still is. Um, it deals with suspect documents of all kinds. And that's its main uh, thing, protecting the president's just sideline. Um, and I contacted them and said, can I get these photos? And they never, I'm still waiting for that phone call back. <laughs> And uh, I'd been, in the meantime, I'd been talking to the curator of the Ford Stephen Museum. And I told her what, you know, what I'd been doing. And she's like, oh, I have those right here. Okay. So she sent me a set. So that's one of the Secret Service photos in the bottom and uh, the diary that I'm working on above it. Uh, the only change we made, which was um, requested, was it, I made it mine slightly wider because they felt like it would appear tiny in the actor's hands. Um, so I think mine is about a quarter of an inch wider. Otherwise, it's uh, pretty close to identical. Um, and so what I did was I did a, a show and tell presentation uh, for the director. I sent the stuff for the show and tell presentation for the director and said, you gotta, like, we gotta show this real diary. Like, let's make the real thing because, you know, it's so cool and here's the background story and everything like that. So it ended up, I, you know, I can't take credit for it, but it ended up playing a bigger part in the story of the movie because it's like, you know, tailor made for a movie like National Treasure.
Uh, the original, uh, uh, the producers got, I made six copies, the leather uh, case, uh, the other change I made is you can pull, you can take the diary out from the leather case. I mean, you have to do things like that with movie props because of, they might make changes and you have to be able to. But I think he wants to know where the original. Diary oh, where is. the original, it's in the Ford Theater Museum. Sorry, yeah, I thought you meant the original prop. The original prop, I think, uh, is in the Disney Museum as well. But again, another one of those sold in this summer at the auction in England, and uh, I think it was eight thousand it fetched. And now the single burnt page is like four thousand pounds. So yeah, I'm sitting on a gold mine. Um, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. I'll I'll answer it. Um. So this is the making of, uh, they used a, a kind of leather that had this uh, line pattern embossed in it and you can't buy anything like that now. So uh, that is uh, hand dyed and embossed goat skin, um, embossing it line by line with a wood burning tool. You haven't lived till you've smelled goat leather and burned with a wood burning tool. It's just, mm. uh, dying. Uh, uh, paring down the edges to make it really thin. Uh, just, you know, the whole process. This is ended up, like I said, making six copies for them. An additional, I always make backup copies. If they ask me for three copies of something, I make six and keep three because I've had FedEx packages go missing. And then, you know, it's in the schedule for being shot. And that way you've always. <laughs> idea of the process. Uh, that's my daughter Daisy. She was seven year old, seven years old. I tried to tell her that there's, um, you know, laws against uh, child labor, but kids, you know, <laughs> they don't listen. Um, and then, so that, the previous slide, that's the thing constructed and made. And then there I am beginning the uh, aging process. So you're literally, when you're working to recreate something that actually exists, everything in it. Uh, this was uh, uh, because they were very, very concerned with everything being accurate. Uh, they made a, a couple of mistakes and there were a couple of times where something accurate didn't really work for how they wanted the scene to work. Um, and so we had to figure out a workaround of making something that'll work, but it, you know, is as close to accurate as we can make it. But otherwise, in the first, in the second season, I was re getting requests from the showrunner who literally was who were these staples period correct period correct is what were the staples period correct so I was having to go um, and get patents for stuff like staplers and things to show them that yes this this staple would have been in a document in 1920 and so you know it it, it just um, really fed into my you know ocd kind of let's get everything crazy detailed and it's going to flash across the screen 50 feet from the camera for a millisecond you know uh so the, these are evidence labels uh that were uh hand typeset using uh, early 20th century and late 19th century lead type and hand printed um this was one where the research, the amount of time I had to spend on research was, you know, more than I could bill for, because then you send the invoice in and somebody goes, wait a minute, you know, you're billing us for three weeks of work on a driver's license, but 
uh, it was impossible to find period driver's licenses from this particular time and place. And uh, it took, like in, in that case, I mean, you can't just Google stuff. You have to kind of search online, obviously, but uh, find all kinds of creative workarounds to get around the limitations of Google. For one thing, I never used Google as my first search engine. I used DuckDuckGo also because it's, uh, it doesn't save anything. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I have to look for all kinds of weird stuff too. So it's like all of a sudden you see ads on Facebook for 1980s porn. It's like, oh, great, yeah. Because I did, you know, some, that was the one that made me realize, oh, wait, I think I need to get an anonymous search engine here because I'm getting really weird things popping up on Facebook that relates to stuff that I've searched out. But uh, another thing is finding little archives. Uh, at that time, you know, I mean, now it, there's these fantastic library archives, digital archives uh, that you can talk through. And some are more organized than others. The Library of Congress has everything, but it's a horrible organization. Uh, but where I tended to find a lot of stuff, especially for Boardwalk Empire, were these tiny little archives in small towns. And this license came from a photograph that was on a website for a local police department small town police department out you know in the midwest and they had a bunch of stuff on display including the license and it was a photograph so i had to like you know crop in get this really low res image and then blow it up and try to reconstruct this document using you know this really blurry thing and you know again like i said it flashes by on the screen 50 feet from the camera um Oh yeah, so that this is a case where this is, um, I mean, we talked briefly about this. This is a, a case, and I'll show you some more as well, where the prop is doing a lot of heavy lifting in terms of the storytelling. Um, this is a character called Chalky White in Boardwalk Empire. He's locked up very briefly. During that time, uh, his wife brings him a book and he's sitting there uh, on, on a bunk reading the book. And another prisoner comes up and gets in his face, and Chalky White tries to ignore him. So the prisoner grabs the book out of his hand and throws it against the wall. And when he does that, the page that Chalky White is holding on to tears out of the book. And the prisoner has to throw the book at the wall, and it lands on the floor. Well, when you do anything to a prop, you automatically have to count for them doing 30 takes. That's sort of the magic number that everybody wants. So. It's like, how does a book, one thing that book, that particular edition, I had to find edition of, an edition of David Copperfield that would have existed in 1920. Then I had to buy them and I have to call up these little booksellers in the middle of nowhere and convince them to take this thing to FedEx to ship it to me for tomorrow. And then I, because the covers were so damaged, I couldn't reconstruct them. I had to uh, recreate them. So I'm um, actually printing on fabric for the two color David Copperfield cover. Then it's the hundred year old book inside, um, but I've taken apart the binding and it's like super reinforced. To, uh, and then I also have to make three copies because between takes they reset. So the actors go through the take, guy throws the book, and then the director says cut, and then they reset. Everybody goes back to the places. The prop master comes in, picks up the book. He puts the torn page back in. And everybody gets ready, cameras roll, they do another take. You do that over and over 30 times. So in order to make reset easier, I gave them three copies of the book. The torn page was actually pre-torn and it was glued with post-it glue down on a, a very thin tab that was bound into the book so that it would just pull out easily. And I gave him uh, three or four places in each book where there were torn pages. So he was you know, he was able to really quickly reset. You don't want to be standing there while everyone's waiting, you know, fussing with something that, that you know, trying to put it back together. Um, and so here's, that's how that prop worked in that scene. But here's the story it was telling. Um, there's a whole other uh, thing that's going on in that scene up front. Um, but what it turns out in the end 
And the thing is, you're basically learning this from the prop is that chalky white can't read. And that's how we learn that from that scene. And he has uh, children who are going to college, you know, who are sort of upwardly mobile and everything. And he comes from a poor background and never learned to read. So it's, they, they use that kind of device a lot in Boardwalk Empire. Um, and that's where, you know, you're part of the storytelling. Your prop is part of the storytelling. Uh, here's another very complicated prop that we barely see that again was originally meant to sort of uh, tell something about a character. He's about to commission new uh, stationery. Um, and that, that scene got changed. And so it ended up playing a very minor role. They just decided they didn't need to do that. But in the meantime, all of those business cards are again, hand type set, hand printed, 19th century type, two colors, uh, you know, assembled in a book with all kinds of letterheads, envelopes and stuff. There they are on the bed of the press. Um, and so here's some more recent stuff. This is uh, from, another HBO show called The Plot Against America. This is another example of props being part of the storytelling. Um, newspapers are great for this because, you know, big headlines. Uh, it, it's, we're learning what's going on at the time, the same, at the same time as the actors are, or as the characters are, I should say. So this is a character who picks up a newspaper. We see the headline. He doesn't have to explain it. They don't have to set up a scene where you know, him and his friend are going, hey, did you hear FDR sold some battleships to Britain? You know, it's like, bang, we learn in one fell swoop. Um, again, the same kind of thing from Plot Against America. Uh, they don't need to get into a lot of, uh, I mean, you know, the thing about a, a movie or a one hour episode show is, they're telling a huge amount of information in a very compressed time frame, and this is a, a quick but also very effective and kind of pleasing way of uh, telling parts of the story without having to get into huge amounts of exposition. So these were for another um, show, which isn't out yet. A great show called The Boston Strangler, which gets into the kind of the the real story of the Boston Strangler, which um, uh, I didn't remember, which is he was never convicted of strangling anyone. Uh, he was convicted of rapes. And uh, it's possible he never did uh, some, or he's uh, been linked positively to one of those strangling murders in Boston. It's possible he was a copycat. Uh, there's just way more to this story. It's really fascinating. And it's told from the point of view of these two women reporters who kind of broke the story. The cops were really doing a lame job of investigating this. It's like, oh, you know, some old lady got strangled with kids. And um, these women reporters were like, wait a minute, you know, they were talking to the cops on the scene. And there were certain things that were similar. And they were bugging the cops saying, hey, these things are linked. And they're like, nah, nah, nah. And so they went to the editor. And at that time, women reporters reported on this season's hemlines and, hey, there's a new model of a toaster. And, you know, it just wasn't done that women reporters uh, would report on a crime story like this. And uh, they did. And it became a huge thing. The cops were embarrassed. They investigated it. Uh, they became part of the story. The newspaper would say, you know, lady reporters, break story of strangling victim, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so really interesting story. And again, a lot of what we learn uh, as the audience is told through the headlines of the, of the newspapers. I'm almost done. You once guy. said you had dozens of newspapers in your basement. I do. I have, um, I have what was originally, or what became the London Times uh, a copy of that from the 1600s, 1600s. I have a copy of a magazine called Bell's Messenger, uh, several copies from the 1700s. I've got a New York Times from, I think it's 1840. Um, I've gotten dozens of newspapers. I find 
you can uh, find certain things online, but with newspapers, uh, oftentimes they are they are what what you see online was uh, done as microfiche in the seventies, so it's not high quality, and also you have no idea what the size is. Um, you have to sort of guess, like oh, it's about this big. So whenever I'm working on a movie with newspapers, the first thing I do is uh, reach out to dealers. I go on eBay and I buy a ton of newspapers of the actual newspapers that I'll be working on so that uh, you know I can replicate things. For instance, in the Boston Strangler, there's a whole, a lot of it is, is uh, taking place inside the newspaper offices, um, which they do a great job of replicating. So this is in the early 60s. And, um, Newspapers at that time were still printed letterpress, so they were still printed from uh, metal plates, and uh, you know, which are inked and then pressed into the paper. You know, obviously at high speed, or they use stereotypes. Yeah, exactly. And um, so, and a lot of what I do on these things is, uh, is consultation. So they'll say, we're doing this newspaper movie, uh, we're doing all these newspapers, we haven't done any research yet, or we've done a minimal amount of research. So what are we looking at? What, you know, what do we need to know about this? Um, so I said, that's how these newspapers would have been done. They weren't designed newspapers in those days. It was like a bunch of, you know, makeup. And yeah, a bunch of guys, with dirty aprons on, you know, working down in the basement were uh, setting things up and they, Oh, this, if I set the typeface or I set the headline in this typeface, it won't fit. So I'll use this typeface. You know, it wasn't consciously like, like let's make it the most beautiful thing that we can. Um, but they had these scenes that were taking place uh, as the newspapers were being, before they were printed, let's say. And so they wanted to show um, them being pasted up. And I said, well, they, there's no way, paste up is a way of putting magazines and newspapers together uh, that was current into what, the 80s, I guess, late 80s? Current into the late 80s. Yeah. yeah. So you would have been. But take, it only would have been for a 10, 10 or 15 year period. Yeah. So they said, let's, we want to do paste up. So this is one of those things where I said before, you have to figure out a workaround where you're trying to be period correct because that's everybody's very concerned about the, that these days but it doesn't work for what they need to do because the they would have had to find like you where do you find a place that still is printing newspapers from stereotypes there is nowhere you know the new york times is printed in a building that's the size of a small town it's that's just the press it's vast and you know and the old ones in the basement were you know you could stand next to them and it was you know 25 feet high but you know it was still a printing press as opposed to a building um so there there was a budget constraint basically in in uh, that would have um made it difficult to shoot the scenes in the room we did a lot of work trying to figure out how to make it work trying to find a place that still you know that we could either make look like an old place or it, it was enough like it it just it didn't work out so and these were for the gilded age this is some of the stuff i did for the gilded age uh and this is a case where so you know i told you about props where it's a very important part of the storytelling a lot of what a prop master has to do is anticipate things that he's going to be called on to do because a lot of what you end up doing on movies is very very rushed and last minute so you try to get out ahead of, of as much stuff as you can so the prop master said, okay, we're working on something that takes place in 1882. There's going to be tobacco. People are going to be lighting candles. I'm going to need matches. So it was just an open-ended thing. Make me a bunch of matches. So again, I didn't need to go so crazy, but I couldn't resist, you know, hand drawing the labels. And I worked on another show where I actually handmade the wooden boxes, which was really dumb, but, you know. Do you ever do housework? Yeah, I don't do windows. Yeah, I know I don't do housework. I it it's like my place is, you know, ankle deep in scraps of paper and stuff. It's just I don't have time. So this is um, another thing that I do is uh, because I make props. So I don't just design props, but I consult on period stuff. 
And I also make stuff. I have a, a shop, I have a letterpress shop and uh, I bind stuff. And this is, I occasionally get jobs where I'm working on someone else's design. So this is for an upcoming movie, uh, Disney's Haunted Mansion. That's their design. Basically what happens is I get a file and then I just get to make it look however I want. I mean, they, I talk to the prop master and say, you know, how does this work? Does an actor take it down? And we, other scenes where they're open. We go through how he needs it to work for what he needs. And then I'll, I'll you know, make the book so it's very collaborative. Um, this is another example. This is for another movie that's not out yet. Usually I don't show stuff that is not yet, but. Um, but this group is special. <laughs> for you people. Um, so this is for a movie that's coming out called Sharper. And it's about a con man who sort of takes on rich people in New York. I don't know anything about it. I didn't get a script on this one. I just had was requested to make a first edition of Jane Eyre. And this is one of those situations where you do the research and you look at it and go, oh boy, you know, okay, the first edition of Jane Eyre appeared in three volumes. It's very plain. It was done as a very limited run. They didn't think it would sell that much. You know, it, it, it it wasn't like they didn't know they were doing the first edition of Jane Eyre. You know what I mean? It's like they didn't realize it was going to be an important book. So they just did a real basic thing. And I know that I'm going to have this uncomfortable uh, conversation with the art department where I'll say, well, you know, it's in three volumes, first off, because they're expecting a book. And it's really plain. And they're like, oh, no, that's great. We love that. We want it to look like dead on like the real thing which, you know, that maybe happens 50% of the time for in this kind of situation where something is very, very plain. Um, so if you're ever offered a um, first edition of Jane Eyre, uh, show it to me first to make sure that it's not one I made. This is, again, another uh, movie that isn't out yet, but it will be out next month, Shazam 2, uh, Fury of the Gods, I think it's called. Uh, this is another example. Of, so these are gigantic tomes. Uh, and Shazam 2 the, is uh, about these kids who say Shazam and they turn into superheroes. Um, so they asked me to make these books. There was lots of back and forth at the design stage about you know the books and how big and all this kind of stuff. So I'm finishing off the books and I said to the prop master, okay, do you want my assistant to fly down to Atlanta where they're shooting this and bring the books with them? And he said, no, no, just ship them. Right? And I was like, well, you know, there's uh, six books. They weigh 30 pounds each. Might be cheaper to just have somebody fly down. Like, what? They weigh 30 pounds each? Man, the kids handling them. And I was like, yeah, but I, you know, I told you, I specifically said, are the kids going to be handling these books because they're going to weigh a ton? And he said, no, 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 it's the adult. And it turns out it is the adult actors, but I think there's a couple of kids in the scene. But this is an example of the kind of exposition that you'll see in movies and that uh, books or newspapers are often used for this type of thing. So we have these new bad guys in this movie because it's a sequel to the first Shazam. And this is the scene where all the superheroes are sitting around this library going through these books with illustrations that tell the backstory of these bad guys. So they, they came from ancient Greece, they were you know uh, bad, so they were locked up in this bubble and then blah, 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 and, and now here they are wrecking the city. Um, so it's a way of <laughs> letting the audience know who, who these people are. There's uh, making the books, you can kind of get a side, uh, feeling for the side. <laughs> and that's it. Oh, yeah, thank so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Oh, thank you. So and much. I will add a few comments at the end, but I know I'd like to take time to take questions. And I know I rudely cut off someone yes. in this over here. So please ask your question now. Was that Lizzie Borden in the Book of Secrets? Was that a picture of Lizzie Borden? Yes, it was. Good spotting. 
that's that was me desperately trying to fill up you know the the pages and i had this photograph of lizzie borden and i i wrote on it with a fountain pen i wrote love lizzie and put it in there and there's there's lots of documents like there that kind of hint at stuff but don't you know they're not there's no real specific kind of reason that they're in there other than to make people go ah you know are you one of those people that looks at movies to find the anomalies? Yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> Hi, that, that was fascinating. Um, I'm a bibliophile and oh. I really, really resonated deep down in my soul and oh. I wish that I could even have the scent of these because you know, when you walk into a library yeah. There's this fabulous scent, but my question really was, um, how do how would anybody identify the hero copy versus copies two through infinity? And do you have like uh, page markers on it? Do you water stamp it? But uh, so I'm very the, curious about that. You're talking about the extra copies of the props. Well, the hero copy, right? Yeah, there's yeah. copy one, and then there's multiple copies. How do we know what 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 copy that is? And yeah, who made it? Or right, it, it's very difficult. Um, I mean, I keep track, and I I sign things in a certain secret place, um, and date them. So, I mean, I have had uh, occasions where so I know a lot of uh, prop collectors and prop replicators who have contacted me over the years. The Book of Secrets. There's a, a, a web forum called the VRPF, T H E R P F, uh, Replica Prop Forum is what RPF stands for. And it's vast. And there, it's a, a lot of people who are in the community of collecting and fabricating their own versions or their own copies of a prop. And so, so through people I've met through there and collectors that I've uh, you know, been in contact with. Um, occasionally I'll get someone who says to me, hey, there's a guy on eBay, he's selling a copy, he says he's a friend of yours and that you sold this to him as a screen used copy. And I'll, I'll, you know, so there's this sort of community that to a certain extent uh, monitors that stuff a little bit where they can. And I, I tell you, I've probably been contacted five or six times by people saying, hey, I just spotted this, what's going on? I won't do anything about it, but I'll tell the person what the real story is. And they'll often contact, for instance, eBay and have them take the auction down, um, you know, stuff like that. Now, sometimes people don't really care. They're just like, as long as it was made either, see during production, uh, production made is like the next level down from screen use. Um, and a lot of times, to tell you the truth, like, for instance, the Maltese Falcon, there's several copies of that around, there's several fakes. Uh, they don't know which of the copies was on screen. Nobody kept track of that kind of thing. So maybe they all were, maybe just one was. Um, maybe, you know, there were a couple of backups that never even made it onto the set. Didn't they smash the Maltese Falcon? No. no. Well, they scrape it. And it, it's they, they, it's supposed to be solid gold covered with lead. So he scrapes it at some point. So there would be one that has scrapes on it. But it can be very difficult to tell the actual screen use copy. I know for the Book of Secrets because I use uh, um, goat hides for everything. So I, I, um, they're often very you know rough around the edges, these goat hides. And uh, by that, I mean, there's often scars and, um, you know, holes from where they've been shot, you know, whatever it is. Um, sorry if anyone's, you know, I have pets, so, you know, I understand if that is upsetting. But uh, the hide I used for the screen used Book of Secrets has a scar on it. And I know where that is. And you can see it in pictures. So, um, you know, I, I keep track of that stuff myself so that if somebody contacts me, I can say, no, that's not, you know, if I know, like in a lot of cases where I, that, that was a case where one copy got screen used. Um, I couldn't be that definitive with the, 
with the John Wilkes Booth diary because there were uh, six copies, as I mentioned. And I, I have no idea. I wasn't on set for some of that stuff, so I don't really know if there was a one copy um, used and others in backup. And, and I, to tell you the truth, again, the prop master wouldn't know. He wouldn't know unless he keeps very, very detailed records. So I realize that's probably not a very satisfying answer, but that's kind of how it goes. It's, you know, everything's just, there's a million moving parts in a movie and they're all flying at top speed, you know, in any given day. And so it can, it can be difficult to keep exact records. There's some hands back there. Right. And I'm afraid we're just going to take a couple more uh, questions, and I'm sure the audience, and certainly in person, can ask you the questions when they come up to buy your book. But we will just take we will just take a couple of more questions, and okay. I do want to say that the online audience, please feel free to submit questions. Ross, I know that you mentioned that some of the books wound up at the Disney Museum, but. Um, in movies, whether or television shows, how do you find what what uh, is the fate that props meet? And do the actors or directors, you know, do people say, "Can I have it?" But what happens? That does happen. Um, I made a bunch of uh, for uh, Quentin Tarantino's movie uh, The Hateful Eight. I made a bunch of um, Red Apple. Red Apple is a tobacco cigarette brand that appears in every Quentin Tarantino film after Pulp Fiction, uh, including Pulp Fiction. And uh, for because the, it takes place roughly in the 1870s, for the Hateful Eight, um, I made it as loose tobacco tin and completely redesigned it. And I sent, I think, you know, maybe six tins on set. And they contacted me and said, Can you send more? And it's like, Oh, okay, send more. Contact me again. Can you send more? And I'm like, What's going on? They said they keep walking off set. So, um, People were taking them and I've seen them sold for thousands of dollars. So, yeah, but uh, mostly what happens with, it depends on the show. If it's a huge thing, like National Treasure Book of Secrets was, was a big deal. And I guess, I don't know, made a ton of money or something. So that was why uh, it was displayed in you know, the Library of Congress and, and Disney. A lot of shows, what happens to the props afterwards is they get um, sold to a, an auction house that auctions them off. And uh, if you uh, do some searching online, there's one particular place that's called Screen, Screen Bid. Screen Bid at any given time is auctioning thousands of props from all kinds of TV shows, uh, different things. And, and then sometimes those auctions will go on for years. Um, so they'll have, and they'll, and everything's very carefully labeled. So they they keep track of it now a lot more than they used to. Um, back in the old days, it was once the movie was done, nobody cared. It was like throw everything away, abandon the sets in the desert, you know. Um, now everything they've realized it's a revenue stream. So um, you can go online and buy, you know, the shirt so and so wore in this episode of whatever the hell. Um, yeah, so it's it's much more uh, tracked than it used to be. Um, so, we had a, a guy and I'll, oh, I'll sorry, just, I'm sorry. No, it, it was just a comment, you know, uh, we've had the, first of all, that was delightful, thank you. thank you. And we've had the great fortune of having some filming here. I don't know if Karen mentioned yeah. that to you, but just you hit on, on several of the productions and I just wanna share that with, audience because it kind of sets the stage in here for example when you said the gilded age they kicked off in february of 20 with a table reading where every one of the actors wow. was here so that was a lot of fun yeah and then you said boardwalk empire and i'll never forget when sal cassano our former fire commissioner walked in onto this the property and said wow i feel like i'm in an episode of Boardwalk Empire, <laughs> and they did do filming here for the first season. So that was interesting. And uh, the list kind of goes on and on, but I have to ask you specifically about John Wick because two and three, mm -hmm. there were some scenes here. So it was what, the Continental Switchboard. Oh, that right was that was up there. Yeah. Yeah. Did, that was I worked on those. Oh, yeah. you did. I did. I did some of the Wonderful. documents that those. Uh, so they're the John Wick 
in there are these scenes where um, everything is done sort of analog. Uh, in, in other words, any transactions that people do are, there's, there's no online or digital anything. And so they have these scenes where these women who are all dressed alike, they all have tattoos and horn rim glasses, they're all <laughs> working in this room, uh, filing all the paperwork and communicating, you know, sending off um, whatever, uh, you know, right. tickets and in the various pneumatic things. tubes. Yeah. Pneumatic tubes, right. right? Yeah. So that was all done in here. I did some of the paperwork for that. That's fascinating. I'm going to yeah. pass the mic over to to someone else, but I have to say we meet a lot of the people in production. But uh, it's so nice to to know it was attached to you. So thank you. Yeah. Well, someone I was working. I'm. Mean, I've been working on a movie called Imaginary Friends, which is directed by John Krasinski, and. Uh, uh, we have someone at the back uh, if we have time for one more question. Right. Well, I'm going to, I know they're not. Okay, we'll, we'll take two, but then that okay. will be it. But like I said, you can meet uh, Steve, Stephen and Ross at the book selling table. But okay, I'm just going to take, I'm going to take, I'll take this gentleman and then I'll take that gentleman and then we can. We'll, okay, we'll finish it. Okay. But, info, but you, of course, can informally talk to people afterward. Okay. But I yeah, just, yeah, yeah. okay. Thank you, Ross, that was terrific. Wow. Um, I have two questions. One, have you ever been approached by somebody who truly wanted you to make an illegal forgery for some purpose? <laughs> and then secondly, um, is your daughter interested in following in your footsteps? Oh, wow. Uh, I have been approached by people to do illegal forgeries. Um, Oftentimes it's sort of like, oh, well, you know, like they're trying to sort of hide the fact, like I, I just need uh, for this um, university, this thing I'm doing at my university, you know, I need a blah, blah. And it's like the story falls apart very easily. And no, my daughter, who's super creative, uh, is currently studying biology and chemistry, biochem. Yeah, there you go. Ross, thank you very much. Very interesting behind the scenes. Uh, could you tell us what props did you actually do for the John Wick movies? What did you create a particular prop? Okay, so in the third movie, uh, there's a scene where he has a fight with the guy in the New York Public Library and he kills him with a book. I made that book. <laughs> <laughs> there's a scene where... He goes, so this, uh, like I said, everything's analog in those movies and um, everybody pays for everything with these gold coins. And when you, so he, John Wick is a, as a hitman and it's this whole community of hitmen and they all stay in this hotel called the Continental and everything is handled through the Continental. All of their assignments are handled through the mechanism of this hotel. And um, also uh, hits are put out on people or people are given, you know, various kinds of status through these other larger coins, um, I, which I did not make those. I, I, I worked a lot with the designer who did a lot of the other stuff for John. Um, but there's a scene where he's on the run and he goes into the New York Public Library. He pulls this old Russian storybook off the shelf. He opens it up, it's a hollow book. And this is again, one of those things where they're using a prop to tell us something. In the hollow book, he finds a photograph of his ex-wife which is in the beginning of the first movie. And he finds, and he kind of has a bit of a, a moment looking at the photo. And then he finds some gold coins and he finds some larger coin. And, and originally in that scene, there was gonna be a gun. So um, <clears throat> it got, and there was this whole period where we were trying to make the book work with a gun. And, but they weren't sure what gun, cause then it's like, of course, you know, and the movies like that, they're, everyone's really wrapped up in what gun the guy uses, you know. And so um, we were trying to finagle how this was going to work with the gun and the loose coins and the paperwork and everything like that. And then all of a sudden they said, no gun. Uh, and I'm like, okay, thinking to myself, like, oh, there's this scene where, you know, someone attacks him in the library and where's this gun, you know? So then when I saw the movie, uh, of course, they took the gun away because it's way more fun that he kills the guy with a book. 
And the guy is ginormous. He's like, he's literally seven feet tall. And uh, there's this gif that you can get of John Wick pounding the book over and over into the guy's mouth. So I made that for uh, the third book in the, or his third movie. In the first movie, they had asked me, there was this whole backstory for John Wick. So we see him at the beginning of the movie. His wife has been, has died of cancer and she's left him a puppy. Okay. And then we see him sort of moping around uh, about, about his wife and everything like that. And <clears throat> then of course these bad guys kill the puppy and that's it. He, he goes off and kills half of New York. Um, originally there was a backstory to the John Wick character. After his wife dies, he goes back to his first love, which is restoring uh, 19th century children's books. So there's, uh, I trained Keanu Reeves in book binding um, and they rented all of the stuff from my uh, shop and set up and you only, they cut it all out because of course, you know, the, the, they needed to put in more mayhem and, and killings. Um, you know, we're only up to 150 killings. We need to cut out that whole part. So uh, you do see the set. You do see there's a scene where he goes down and he's got his room in the basement and I think he maybe looks at his phone or something. And then he gets a sledgehammer and starts smashing the floor. And there's a big suitcase full of gold coins and guns. Yeah. Well, that's all in his bookbinding studio. If you look at it, uh, again, you'll see there's a book press and all kinds of stuff in there. Well, this leads to another movie called Biblia Side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's work with a screenwriter. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I want to express our appreciation for this, to see your exquisite work and to find out about the amount of research that goes into it and then to see the end result. We, I think we speak on behalf of all of us that we can't wait to see the new productions that are coming out and also to see in the re-look again at the old movies. We so appreciate you sharing your expertise and Stephen, thank you very much for facilitating the conversation and for your incisive questions. So thank you both so much. Thank Thanks you for having us. Yeah. And, and just to add to Karen's comments, thank you so much for giving us another dimension as we look at movies and television to look more closely at things. And I personally learned a lot of these props appear on the set and I, it, you added, you know, much more depth to, to my knowledge. And I have to say, Stephen, you're a very, you're a dear supportive friend, I can see, to uh, Ross. And that comes across, oh, that it's a wonderful relationship. So beautiful to see. Thank you. And I know. I do want to mention this book happens to be for sale, and I think both Ross and Stephen would be willing uh, to autograph it. So, and it's available at the back of the room. Um, so please, please, and I also hope that our in-person audience will also join us for a glass of wine. And I am going to ask, I know I terminated the questions prematurely, but I am going to ask that you hold off on your questions until Ross and Stephen are sitting at the back table. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.